The Michael Soroka era is over in Atlanta as they made a late night trade on Thursday, shipping him and others off to the Chicago White Sox for Aaron Bummer. Going to break down everything on this trade on today's episode of Locked On Braves. So let's get into it. You are Locked On Braves, your daily Atlanta Braves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, and welcome back to Lockdown Brave, part of Lockdown Sports Atlanta, where we cover your favorite Atlanta sports teams each and every day. I am your host, Jake Mastriani. You can follow me on social media at Shortstop Ball. Also, make sure you check out my written work over at Bravestoday.com. We'll have plenty of coverage breaking down this trade with the White Sox. Make sure that you follow the podcast on social media as well at Lockdown underscore Braves. I will still have a mailbag episode on Friday as well, so look for my post from Locked on underscore Braves on social media and submit your questions to that post to be answered on Friday's mailbag episode. If you're new on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up button as well to help support the show. Thanks so much to all of you everydayers out there who turn in and listen to Lockdown Braves every day, making it your first listen of every single day as well. Really appreciate all the support. We're going to get into the trade today with the White Sox, moving Michael Soroka and others over there for Aaron Bummer. Before we do that, though, today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50-plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. All right, if there wasn't enough excitement for you on Thursday night with Acuna winning the MVP, then going out in the Winter League, his Winter League debut, hitting a home run, Braves get in the All-Star game back late night after I had fallen asleep. They make a big trade with the Chicago White Sox, sending over Michael Soroka, Nicky Lopez, Jared Schuster, Braden Shoemake, and Riley Goins for Aaron Bummer. And that's a lot of names, and it's a lot of names the Braves are giving up for a lefty relief pitcher. We're going to get into it and discuss it all. I do want to give a shout-out to some of those who are here live as I'm recording, Brandon Dukes, Cameron, Josh Daniels, Leland, Docs Cards, uh, Jessica, Brandon Newman as well are here. Leland Hurt, thanks so much for joining me for this surprise episode of Locked On Braves. But just a lot to discuss in this trade, so I wanted to do a separate podcast just for it. I'm sure we'll have some other questions that come up on our Friday mailback episode. But I wanted to break down this trade because it's a very interesting one. Like I said, when you look at this trade, and you look at you know five for one, <laughs> you look at that from a Braves fan, and you think, well, we're giving up a lot for a guy, a lefty reliever who's coming off of ERA, you know, a, a season where he had an ERA over six. Matt Mock, Nick in here as well. Thanks so much for being here. Um, that is a, it does seem like a lot. And, and I'm not going to lie, when I woke up this morning, the baby woke me up at 5 a.m., and I, I brushed off my eyes and I checked the, the social media and I saw the trade. My immediate immediate reaction was, whoa, <laughs> I think that's what I posted. It's a lot to give up. It's a lot of depth to give up. Now, when we break it down and we'll talk about it, it makes a lot of sense. But it still just feels like the Braves gave up a really you know good amount of depth in this move. And let's start out before we get into Aaron Bummer and what he you know could bring to the Braves. Let's talk about what they're giving up first, because I think that's what stands out to a lot of Braves fans when they look at this trade is, is what did the Braves give up? And I think the name that probably sticks out to most is Michael Soroka and somebody who you know has given the Braves a lot. The Braves have given him a lot, sticking with him as he's gone through a lot of injuries, but you know, a guy that came up, looked like he was going to be a top of the rotation pitcher for a long time in Atlanta. And unfortunately, you know, the Achilles injuries is not just the Achilles injuries. He's had shoulder issues as well. But injuries in general have just really slowed him down. It was pretty clear coming back this season. He is still struggling to adjust, understandably, as he tries to figure out these new mechanics that he's trying to use to avoid further injury. And I think the Braves just had to look at it and say, here's a guy we don't know if we can depend on, and we basically have to roster him because he's out of options, and we're going to have to pay him $3 million. When we did our podcast a while back, and Friday's also the deadline for non-tenders, which is why you're going to see 
a lot of these deals, maybe not to this degree, but you're going to see a lot of other trades happening throughout the day on Friday with the non-tender deadline. But we did a podcast a while back, and I talked about guys who could be non-tendered, and I had Soroka in that camp of players I thought would be non-tendered for this very reason. He is out of options, so you can't just send him down to AAA. If you do, he's you know probably either going to get claimed off waivers or elect free agency to go to a team where he can pitch. And again, it's just the risk of paying him $3 million, not knowing what you're going to get and not having that ability to option him. The writing was kind of on the wall with Soroka. I said then my best case scenario is the Braves just non-tender him, but work out a minor league deal to be able to keep him in-house, allow him to continue to work on things and hopefully come back. But instead, the Braves use him in this deal clear up a roster spot, get a reliever back in return, and give Soroka, hopefully, I hope, a chance to pitch with a what's about to be a rebuilding team in the White Sox and give him a, a shot over there in their rotation where I feel very comfortable that he you know, has a, has a good shot of winning a rotation spot over there. So wish the best for Michael Soroka. You know, I, I wish he would have gotten a better shot at things this past year. Look, when he came up, it wasn't great. It's not like he... He did a lot to deserve that, but neither did a lot of the other guys the Braves use this year. The, the Yanni Torino's experiment just still bugs me. I wish you could have given Soroka five straight starts like that to allow him to, to continue to work on those kinks at the big league level because he was fine at the AAA. You take his numbers at AAA, you know, and if you could get that at the big league level, he would be fine. But the Braves are obviously in win now mode. They cannot, they cannot risk taking on Soroka in the rotation. A guy with no options, paying him $3 million. So, unfortunately, had to let Soroka go. Again, wish the best for him. I hope he figures it out. I still think he can. I think he can be a serviceable big league pitcher again. But it's going to take some time for him to get back. You know, Missing several years, completely overhauling his mechanics. But wish all the best for Michael Soroka. You know, couldn't root for a better guy. And certainly will still be rooting for him with the White Sox wherever he ultimately ends up. Maybe one of the biggest surprise names, maybe to some people, uh, was Nicky Lopez. There are people on Nicky Lopez, you know, my colleague Lindsey Crosby included, who thought maybe he could overtake Arcia for the shortstop job with the Braves. Uh, Mark Bowman, MLB.com, wrote just the other day, you know, how valuable Nicky Lopez is and how he's worth that potential $4 million price tag. And the Braves included him in this deal, which tells you they thought it's kind of, I thought again, when we did the non-tender discussion, I thought 4 million for a glove first bench bat. I thought that was way too expensive and I would have considered non-tendering him. And it sounds like the Braves were considering non-tendering him as well. Um, but again, I think this one came as a, a bit of a surprise for people because now there is a hole on the bench. You're going to have to replace that, you know, that spot. I mean, you can do that. You can find utility, bench players for a million dollars you certainly can i mean just go pick up a charlie culberson he's probably never going to play uh and just sit him on the bench i've heard some people say von grissom could feel that role no if von grissom comes up he needs to play nicky lopez wasn't going to play unless there was an injury or you're just giving rc a day off here or there braves don't use their bench <laughs> so it is you know to pay a guy four million who might play two three games a month uh, again, that always seemed like a, a pretty easy non-tender for me. And again, apparently the Braves agreed with that. They ship him off in this trade. Maybe the one that did surprise me the most was the Jared Schuster one. And I say that knowing Jared Schuster is not a good pitcher. I don't think he'll ever be a really good major league pitcher. But in a 162-game season, you need guys like this. And Schuster's a guy who... You know, at his ceiling is a fifth starter, but he has options and he has big league experience. I mean, he's somebody over 162. You may need to come up and give you a handful of starts throughout the season. Now, that said, I think the Braves have some other arms and candidates coming up that have passed him on that depth chart and can fill that role. But I was a little surprised to see Schuster included in this just because you need as much starting pitching depth as possible. The Braves know that, and they gave up a guy who they have options on and it's part of that depth, and they gave him up in this move. Not surprising to me that they traded Schuster, but 
in this deal for a lefty reliever coming off a, a tough season, I, I don't know why Schuster had to be included in this deal. Um, but again, no, no big loss there. That one just kind of surprised me. Braden Shoemake just unfortunately couldn't put it together with the bat. We were teased a little bit this past spring training because the glove looks good and he can play all over the infield. And this past spring training, he looked really good with the bat. But it just didn't carry over into the the AAA season. He's about to turn 26. 198 games at AAA. He slashed 243, 305, 404. So just could not put it together with the bat to be much of anything other than a a bench utility piece for the Braves. So they include him in this deal. And then finally R- Riley Goins, which is somebody honestly didn't even recognize when I saw the name in the trade ninth round pick out of Illinois in this past draft just turned 24 reliever profile had a good a good brief sample size in his first professional season after getting drafted 22 strikeouts in 15 and two-thirds innings so the White Sox get uh, a little bit I guess uh, of an older prospect that perhaps could could fly up and be a reliever for them pretty soon maybe they continue to work him out as a starter so again it seems like a lot is giving up here, but when you break it down, essentially they traded two guys. They were about to non-tender in Soroka and Nicky Lopez, two guys that likely aren't good enough to be on this team. If everything's going well, you're not going to play Jared Schuster or Braden Shoemake. And then they gave up an older prospect who, you know, at his best might become a, a, a low leverage reliever. Um, I don't want, I don't want, I don't know much about Riley Goins. I'm not going to say that that's his, his floor, but it's, you're not giving up much from the White Sox perspective. I think this is a great trade from the White Sox perspective. Not that I think it's a bad trade for the Braves, but for the White Sox, you get a couple of MLB starters to help give them some innings as they kind of work through things and start this rebuild. And I think that's the biggest part of this trade for them is the Braves were able to give them a couple of guys that can give them some innings and help in their rotation. You know, you get an older prospect uh, in Goins, you get a couple of utility guys. But again, when you kind of break it down, two of these players for the Braves were about to get non-tendered anyway. Two of these players weren't going to have any kind of significant role on this team going forward. And then you got, you know, somewhat of a throw in 24 year old prospect. So not a ton given up, but what did the Braves get? Because you did give up, you know, five players in this deal. What do the Braves get in return? Well, they get a lefty reliever in Aaron Bummer, who the underlying stats look really good, and I think he could become a big piece of this bullpen. We'll talk more about him next. Whether you're on extended travel, bracing for a major weather event, or limited by yet another supply shortage, you are covered with our friends over at Jace Medical. You can go online right now at jacemedical.com and receive your 12-month supply of your daily medication. Thanks to our partners at Jace Medical, they have life-saving antibiotics and a long list of daily medications that can be ordered with a one-year supply. So no more worrying about ordering that refill, refill every month or however often you have to. You can just set it up for a one-year supply over at jacemedical.com. And listen to this customer feedback about Jace. They said, I am so thankful for this service. Supply chain issues caused me to cut pills in half to have it. I ordered most of my daily meds with a year supply. I also ordered an antibiotic kit. I feel secure now. Prices are lower than local pharmacies. I highly recommend this for everyone. And that security is a big thing. I ordered my Jace case. The process was super simple over at jacemedical.com to get that taken care of. And I feel so much secure now for those unexpected events, weather events, whatever it may be. I am now prepared and my family is prepared with that Jace case. Remember when you're there, use our promo code at Locked On for $20 off your purchase. If someone you love would get some a great peace of mind as I have by getting a year supply of any daily med, go to jacemedical.com to see if it's offered for you. And again, use our promo code Locked On at checkout at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. So the Braves gave up a good bit in this trade. What did they get in return? Well, they got a left-handed reliever in Aaron Bummer. And this is a guy I've honestly loved for years. I think I've written several articles in the past about the Braves trading for Aaron Bummer. If you've ever played MLB The Show and faced Aaron Bummer, then you know what I'm talking about. This guy is just, you know, I know MLB The Show is not 
you know, a great comparison to real life, but the guy just has nasty stuff and he's really hard to face. The 30 year old lefty, like I said, he's under team control for three years, which I think is pretty big in this as well. He'll make 5.5 million in 2024. And then he has team options for 7.25 million the next two years. So they, those uh, team options come with $1.25 million buyout. So this is a lefty who's had some good years, has some good stuff, and he's now under team control for the next three years. So that is pretty significant in this trade. A lot of people are going to look at the 6.79 ERA from last year and the 1.53 whip and wonder why the Braves would even take a chance on this guy. Why would they even give up the five guys that they did, even if those guys weren't in the plans for this team? Why would you give up all of that for Aaron Bummer? You got to look a little bit deeper into the numbers for Aaron Bummer to see the value in this guy. You look at some of the expected stats for him, his expected ERA and his FIP, which you know take out you know, defense and, and all of that, uh, park factors, adjusted, all of that. And those numbers were half of what his ERA was last year. So that would tell you he was a bit unlucky. And that can happen. And that can certainly happen when you look at some of the deficiencies that Aaron Bummer has, the biggest one being that he walks way too many batters. He had a 5.55 walk per nine last year, and it's over four for his career. He's always struggled with command and always has high walk rates. He's also someone that generates a lot of ground balls, which can be a good thing at times, but when those balls are finding holes or you don't have a great defense behind him, then that can really work against you. He had a 58.2% uh, ground ball rate last year. That's actually the lowest in his career since 2017. He generates a lot of ground balls. You need somebody to come in and try to get you a double play to get out of an inning. You got a tough lefty coming up. Aaron Bummer is going to be your guy. But with that high ground ball rate, he had a ridiculously high 340 batting average on balls in play last year. So the high walk rate, the high Babbitt, that's going to lead to a high ERA a lot of times. Despite that high Babbitt, batters hit just 236 against him last year, and his expected batting average was even lower at 215. So again, you look at some of the underlying metrics for Aaron Bummer, and you can see why the Braves might want to take a shot on him. Not to mention he's had good years before, and as I said, the stuff is really good. The stuff is just nasty. Yeah, again, if you've ever faced him on the show and you had to try to hit that sinker or that, that slider, sweeper, whatever you want to call it, from that arm angle that he throws, which is somewhat you know sidearm-ish, uh, kind of hides it behind his back for a long time too, and it just comes out of a weird angle, it is tough to pick up. And I think you know the Braves are hoping that you maybe get him a little bit better defense. All the Braves infield defense isn't as great as it's been in the past, particularly up the middle, but Hopefully, you see him kind of get back to his career norms after what was, you know, a highly unlucky 2023, but also coupled with the high walk rates that he had. But you look at the stuff for Aaron Bummer. It's a heavy sinker in the mid 90s. Now that velocity has dropped. It's more 94 miles per hour. Where you know back in the day when he was really good, it was more 96, 97. So the velocity has dropped on that sinker a good bit. And that's probably why we've seen the run value on that sinker go down over the years. It had a positive run value of 20 in 2019, but that's gone down to positive two, negative four, negative two, and negative four in the last four years. So the run value on that sinker has consistently gone down for Aaron Bummer, but he features a sweeper that batters just don't hit. Hitting under 200 against that pitch, well under 200 against that pitch with whiff rates over 40%. And so you wonder with the decline of that sinker, both velocity and effectiveness and how dominant this sweeper can be, if maybe you come to the Braves and maybe they ask him to start featuring that sweeper a little bit more. Now it may come down to the command of that pitch. I haven't watched enough of him to see if he has great feel for that pitch, but certainly the sweeper is a better pitch at this point for him. He'll also sprinkle in a cutter at times, but it's mostly sinker sweeper that he's going to be throwing. He doesn't get a ton of chases outside of the zone. 
is evident by the high walk rate that he has, but he still has elite whiff rates and his barrel percentage is elite as well. 99th percentile last year. That means people are struggling to barrel up the baseball against him, which is a great thing for a pitcher. Obviously you want to be avoiding barrels as much as possible. So again, there are reasons to hope with Aaron Bummer that he can be really good. See Atlanta dogs, 88. What are his numbers against Philly hitters? I don't think it's a complete coincidence that the Braves right now have four lefties in their lineup. And you think about that Phillies lineup with Schwarber and Harper and Stott and all those lefties, tough lefties that they have, that they have gone out this off season and, you know, really stacked up the lefties in the bullpen. And I think he can be really good, especially against lefties. He doesn't give up a ton of, of home runs either, which I'll talk about here in a second. But when you, you write it down, as you do with a lot of things, and you write down the pros and cons of Aaron Bummer, in my mind, there's a lot more positives than negatives. You look at the flaws with Aaron Bummers, it's really he struggles with command, and he can walk himself into a jam. I look at you know the biggest flaw for Aaron Bummer, and it just is the walks. And that's that's honestly it. I mean, the ground ball rate is typically going to be a good thing. It was not particularly a good thing for him last year, really even the year before. But ground balls, you typically want the ball on the ground. The positives for Aaron Bummer, high whip rates. He still gets a ton of swing and miss, which is what you want out of your lever, especially in a, a high leverage situation. Big strikeout potential because of those whip rates. Doesn't allow hardly any home runs a 0.60 home run per nine in his career is minuscule especially in today's game he just does not give up home runs and he holds down lefties lefties are hitting just 199 against him in his career with just three home runs and 426 batters faced he has faced 426 left-handed batters in his career he has given up three home runs so you talk about facing that that Phillies lineup with those lefties that have you know all the slugging potential the Swar Schwarber the Harpers at the top of that order Bummer's given up three home runs to lefties his entire career so again that is another huge positive for getting Aaron Bummer again when I just I break it all down there's just so many more positives for getting him than negatives I don't think this is the sole reason for getting Aaron Bummer but AJ Minter, you know, is a free agent after 2024 and could potentially be gone. He very well has another good year, could get an opportunity to be a closer and get closer type money on another team. And with that control that you now have over Aaron Bummer, it's a possible replacement for him for AJ Minter going forward to give you another lefty option in the bullpen. And talked about it already, but you look at the lefty options the Braves have right now. With Minter, with Aaron Bummer, with Tyler Matzik, with Dylan Lee, they are really, I mean, those are four guys that are going to be in your bullpen. Maybe not Lee. I think he still has some options and certainly still working his way back. It was a bit of a rough year for him. And, and Matzik is a question mark at this point as well. I mean, you very well could get into the season and, you know, Bummer doesn't have a little bit more luck and can't have better command. You could be looking at, you know, Minter as your only real reliable left-handed option, but you look at the positive side of this and you're talking about having four really good lefty relievers in your bullpen. So again, I think the positives far outweigh the negatives of getting a guy like Aaron Bummer, you know, getting him on a winning team, hopefully a little bit better defense. I don't know a ton about the White Sox defense, although I know Tim Anderson's not very good at all uh, at shortstop defensively, but hopefully we see Aaron Bummer you know, uh, you know, come back to his career norms a little bit and be the pitcher that I know that he can be. Now, there's one other thing with all this we have to discuss with all the players that the Braves, you know, sent to the White Sox. That's not an accident either. With that, they've also opened up some roster spots. We'll talk about what that could mean here next. So also in this trade, another aspect of it is that the Braves opened up three roster spots on their 40-man roster. And look, they had the opportunity the other day to non-tender some of these guys, to 
protect guys like Jesse Franklin, Luis Diavila from the Rule 5 draft. They chose not to do that, and then they go out and ship off four guys off their 40-man roster, only bring one back. So if my math is correct, they have three open spots on the 40-man roster now. So that's another part of this move and why it's so lopsided that the Braves are sending so many players over. Again, this was just creating roster space as well as getting a good lefty reliever that they think can be a big part of the bullpen. I think can be a big part of the bullpen as well. Is there something coming with this? And I know that's what a lot of people are speculating on with the Braves opening up so much room on the roster. Is there something else coming? Yes, but I don't think it means anything is coming at this moment. You know, again, there was the non-tender deadline coming up on Friday, so you had to make a decision on a couple of these guys in Soroka and Nicky Lopez, and this just seemed like an opportunity to move some of those guys off as well as some others, clear up some spot, and like I said, get a, a lefty reliever back. But I don't think this particularly means the Braves have something else in the works and we're going to see a, a big deal happen soon. Moves are going to be made, and – the Braves are not going to leave those three roster spots empty this off season, but I, I don't think this is, you know, I don't think this is happening because a big move is coming anytime soon. Jeff Oliver saying, I still want cease. Uh, you got me excited for him last week, Jake. Yeah. I know some people are saying you started these discussions with the white Sox to make this move. Why not just continue those discussions and go out and get a Dylan cease. Maybe uh, perhaps that was part of the, the talks as well, we'll see. But again, I, I don't think I don't think opening up these roster spots is means that uh, something else is imminent. But moves are going to be made, and they were going to have to get rid of some of these guys eventually. And I talked about it again. I thought Soroka was going to get non-tendered. I thought Nicky Lopez had a, a good shot of being non-tendered himself. So uh, it made sense. We'll see what happens on Friday. Maybe there's going to be some other guys cut from the roster. Maybe we see some more trades to move some of these guys off the roster to add some more depth to this team that the Braves can use. I still think there's some 40 man guys on here that could potentially, you know, get non-tendered. Look at a Colby Allard still on here. Uh, Michael Tonkin still on this roster. Uh, you know, there's some other guys on here, Chadwick Trump. You know, I think there's still some room to uh, Forrest Wall. I think there's Luke Williams. There's still guys on this 40 man roster who could go, in my opinion, or that you could make upgrades over. Uh, so again, there's still more more moves to be made, and certainly Braves are going to fill those roster spots at some point. But this was just a way to go ahead and clear some of those spots, get something back in return that you feel like can be useful. I think the Braves are going to be active this offseason. And I like everything that I'm seeing from Alex Anthopoulos, everything I'm hearing from Alex Anthopoulos, and the fact that, you know, he's not satisfied with winning 100 plus games the last two years and getting bounced in the first round. He wants to get over that hump. He wants more out of this team, doesn't want to waste this window that they have. Not saying they're going to go out and sign Shohei Otani like we talked about earlier this week. If you haven't listened to that podcast, go back and do so. It was a lot of fun. But I do think more moves are coming. I think some big moves are potentially coming. I don't think this trade necessarily indicates any of that is imminent or coming soon. But I think the Braves are going to be active this offseason and trying to build out the depth for this 40-man roster and not just depth, but quality depth. So, uh, again, an interesting move. Certainly one if you didn't stay up late last night and you woke up this morning, we're probably a little confused. Uh, surprised by the deal that happened. Hopefully this has helped explain that a little bit and why I do ultimately think it is a good move for the Atlanta Braves. Again, when you break it down, not really giving up too much. Two guys they were going to non-tender, two guys that weren't going to be good enough to be on this roster, and then a 24-year-old prospect that they just drafted. For a left-handed reliever that, when he's on, can be one of the better left-handed relievers in in baseball, in my opinion, and has some dominant stuff and some very good underlying metrics that hopefully the Braves can help unlock and, again, get him back to the really good reliever that he has been in the past. So thanks so much for joining me for this episode of Locked on Braves. I really appreciate all the support here that you give me. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube, hit that like button, follow us on social media at shortstopball at Locked on underscore Braves. We will still have our mailbag episode on Friday night. So be looking out for that post as well to submit your questions to be answered there. 
But that will do it for this episode of Lockdown Braves. Again, make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe to the Lockdown Braves podcast wherever you get your podcast. And we will talk to you next time.